true wireless IEMs with LDAC, ANC, and pass-through for only 55 euros? They surely can't be worth the money. Or can they? My experience with true wireless in-ear monitors is fairly limited and spans only four sets in total, including the AirPods Pro Gen 3 and Oppo Enco Buds 2, the latter being a discontinued model. Given the obviously brutal competition any smaller company must fight against to make any kind of dent in this vast market, I feel that I have a license to be as critical as necessary, especially with these at the extremely competitive price of 55 euros. The first port of call for me with this in-ear monitor was the companion Roselink app that was easily findable through the Play Store. The reason for this was twofold. There is already a downloadable firmware update that apparently improves the functionality of the IEMs, and the IEM that arrived at my door only spoke to me with an enthusiastic Chinese waifu voice. I can only say that for me personally, the change to the English low-bit robotic voice was a huge downgrade. Sadly, I did not make any recordings of the previous voice for comparison. The app itself isn't perfect. Firstly, the app rarely had some trouble connecting to the IEMs, even if they were already connected to my phone's Bluetooth. Although, quickly closing the app and reseating the, the buds in their case, removing them again and starting the app again would immediately fix this. I think this might be because of the low power searching mode, which improves audio quality at the expense of slightly worse ability to initially discover the AIMs over a wireless connection. A decent trade-off and a welcome feature, if you ask me. Also, the app is a little sluggish in its responsiveness, especially when switching between LDAC and dual device connection mode, which requires the user to push a button on screen to give permission for the app to reconnect to the inner monitors, which feels like a completely redundant step that should just occur automatically. The build quality perfectly fits the price tag. There are some micrometer imperfections in the charging case edges and seams, which are of course nothing to complain about until you get to fruit company prices. The biggest surprise for me was initially taking them out of the packaging. The charging box has its own carry case. Personally, I think it's completely unnecessary, as it increases the size to a normal in-ear monitor carry case. But I can also imagine some nerds appreciating this extra step, as these utterly mundane and trivial actions can have the psychological effect of putting you more in the mood for a high-end listening experience, and help you believe that you are truly in possession of something extra special, akin to the process of preparing to listen to vinyl records, albeit with far fewer steps. Again, the case itself is finished well, with a very light rubberized grip, which is in my mind far superior to the glossy, slippery finishes on the common white plastic cases. The hinge feels hard-wearing and snappy, and the subjective appearance is not cheap. Then, opening up the charging box gave me the next surprise. The buds I received were the champagne color. The outer box fits that description fairly well, similar to the high-end Japanese products of the early 90s, but the IEMs themselves are light khaki. Combined with the gray accents, these kind of remind me of old man hiking sandals. So, a huge plus. No one will want to steal these. Of course, I'm not being totally serious, but if aesthetics are extremely important to you, the color mismatch will drive you nuts. The included foam tips, however, are something else entirely unexpected. Not only did they provide an almost equally comfortable fit to the provided silicon tips, but the extra passive isolation works great in tandem with the ANC. I don't want to spend too long going over the differences between normal, ANC, and pass-through mode, so I'll quickly start by mentioning that ANC and pass-through use practically the same DSP profile, and normal mode is slightly different. The tonal response can be broadly described as being vocal and sub-bass focused, with good upper treble extension. The normal mode is my least favorite, since mids around 1 to 2 kHz are pushed too far forward. Those who enjoy vocals may enjoy this, but it produces neither accurate timbre or compatibility with all genres. 
The good news is that a quick and dirty reduction in that area on my phone's EQ almost completely fixes the problem. When using the Earfree i3 with ANC or pass-through, this vocal area is already further reduced, so for my taste I only need to make small change to reach my preferred sound. For my ears, ANC worked shockingly well. On my journey to and from Kanjam, London, I was able to reduce airplane noise down from a roar to a background loud desk fan kind of sound. It's impossible for me to quantify how much of a noise was reduced, but I felt like it was somewhere around the 90 to 93% mark, and with some light music playing in the background, it became almost imperceptible. It doesn't keep up with the best ANC on the market, which is even able to significantly reduce some background talking, but neither would I have expected it to. Both ANC and pass-through were also highly susceptible to wind noise, so I can't recommend using either of those on the street unless it's an especially calm day or the local traffic noise is significantly stronger than the wind. The only times the ANC was not able to compete was the loudest metallic squealing noises of the London Underground train system, and of course, spoken voice, which should surprise nobody. Pass-through was functional, but it was never something I wanted to use, as it amplifies all sounds. I especially did not enjoy trying to talk to my family while cooking, and using it on a loud train, for example, is just migraine fuel. I don't think that's a negative reflection on the i3, only a symptom of the current state of the technology. On the Roselink app, you can choose between three different EQ profiles, pop, hi-fi, and rock. Essentially, they only present three slightly different levels of bass shelf, where hi-fi is the weakest and rock is the strongest. Being a bit of a bass head, I just left it on rock the whole time, as that sounded best to me, as it competed better with the slightly emphasized mid-range. Initially, I thought that the inclusion of LDAC would have been redundant on a lower-priced device such as this. I was completely proven wrong. The difference in audio quality when it is on and off should be clearly audible to the average audio enthusiast, especially in its rendering of high frequencies. On the busiest music that pushes the limits of brick-walled mastering and a full frequency playback, will it be quickly evident that there are limitations to the driver and its implementation, as some rather unpleasant congestion can quickly take over. On slightly simpler, properly mastered recordings, however, the single dynamic driver with its diamond-like carbon diaphragm and Tesla magnet shows off what it can do. As I mentioned, I took these to CanJam London, where I was able to try out many professional IEMs, costing hundreds or thousands of euros, and yet, very few of them could produce the kind of sub-bass I experienced in the Earfree i3. During the whole weekend, only three IEMs I heard were able to deliver the correct visceral bass drop on BFG Division by Mick Gordon at 1 minute 2 seconds. The Rose Technics Earfree i3 was one of them. Of course, Many of the others I heard over the weekend housed arrays of multiple balanced armature drivers that are often not known for producing those kind of sub-bass frequencies. But with a single dynamic, all it takes is a bit of clever tuning and DSP to achieve the kind of sub-bass that delivers ear-shattering slam that is absolutely necessary for some electronic and metal music. Mamba Core by Infected Mushroom is also delivered with authority and a healthy dose of hearing damage, but you can also hear the driver reaching its limits, as the sense of treble, air, and soundstage, while they're not bad in of themselves, can't quite compete with even mid-fi IEMs around 250 euros, or the sub-bass, the likes of which you can only hear from the likes of the The Audio V16 Divinity, for example. So, you can see what's happening, right? I found myself actually making unreasonable comparisons with IEMs way out of its supposed league. For me, it's not as though the i3 gets stomped on by the competition. Yes, micro detail and separation aren't going to be on the same level as those non-wireless 8-driver artworks and so on. It would be unreasonable to expect that. And going to the other extreme of comparing them to something like the True Wireless Noble Audio Focus Prestige, yes, the i3 does get 
absolutely demolished, as does every other true wireless IEM for pure sound quality alone. But if I had to choose between that and the Ear Free i3 for taking with me on public transport or an aeroplane, the choice is obvious, the i3 for its versatility and its features. At no point in my passive listening on the go did I ever feel like I was truly wanting for resolution or more accurate EQ solution. The IEM constantly gave me the feeling that it sounds better than it has any right to at this price point, and I can only give it a solid recommendation for anyone looking at IEMs under 100 euros, especially if you need proper sub bass slam and you're not afraid of a bit of EQ. Trouble heads and soundstage junkies need not apply. That's it for now. Take it easy, and I'll see you in the next one.